Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. I am getting old. I should have brought my glasses. Um, my husband, Avia, and I have a friendly rivalry going about who had the best Torah portion for our bar and bat mitzvahs. My Torah portion was Emor, and in addition to classics like An Eye for an Eye, it gives the calendar of holidays, so we actually read it several times throughout the year. My husband had Ve'et Hanan, this week's Torah portion, and I'll grant you it has some classic lines, the Zotah Torah, the Shema and the Vihafta, and of course the repetition of the Ten Commandments, what my husband likes to call the studio version. <laughs> And just as with the band's live albums and studio albums, there are some differences in the performance. When God gave the Ten Commandments back in Parshat Yitro, God explained that the reason we remember the Shabbat is because God rested on the seventh day after six days of creation. But here, Moses tells us that we need to keep the Shabbat because we need to remember the exodus from Egypt. We were slaves in Egypt and God brought us out. You have to ask yourself, why the difference? I mean, shouldn't Moses be able to go to the tablets that Moses wrote with God on Mount Sinai and like read the text that was there? What's going on? Now, many people much smarter than I have offered commentaries on explanations for this discrepancy. But I like to come at it with an educator's lens. Did God not do a good enough job teaching Moses the Ten Commandments? Maybe Moses wasn't paying attention. <laughs> or was Moses internalizing the lessons and reflecting back the material based on his own experiences? For the past 10 years, I've been a practitioner of project-based learning, or PBL. Project-based learning is an inquiry-based approach to learning in which students gain skills and knowledge by addressing an authentic need in the community. Very fancy, right? Um, what this really means is that students acquire knowledge by trying to solve a problem. When I work with schools who are trying to implement PBL, the hardest thing for teachers is to let go of the control of the learning in the classroom. PBL is student-driven. God might have wanted Moses to repeat the Ten Commandments exactly as God had written them, but God was also willing to step back and let Moses drive his own learning and understanding of the material. We are living in an information age. Anything that we, we might want to know is in our pockets, on our smartphones. I would argue that Jewish education is no longer focused or no longer needs to be focused on providing students with all the knowledge that they need to lead fulfilling Jewish lives, but rather on providing them with experiences that inspire them to become lifelong Jewish learners. Now, I know it seems odd for me to tell you about experiential education rather than letting you experience it, but I was given a very strict time limit, so I apologize. But in a, instead, let me tell you about a few experiences and expeditions that I've gone on with my students to learn with them. So project-based learning always begins with the content. What do we want? our students to know. A few years ago, I was running a school in Cambridge and we were trying to teach our students about Ahavat Yisrael, a love of Israel. Now in our curriculum, this meant that we needed to teach them about Am Yisrael, a love of the people of Israel, Eretz Yisrael, a love of the land of Israel, and Medinat Yisrael, a love of the state of Israel. This is a little more difficult than I would have anticipated because my students, as young as eight, were pushing back on me, telling me that they could not support the state of Israel because they couldn't support a state that would oppress Palestinians. So the teachers and I decided to plan a PBL expedition around the upcoming Israeli elections. So it was the first of the marathon elections. So our goal was to get students to understand how decisions are made in a country and how people they might support that they might agree with might be willing to support policies that they don't agree with. Now, every learning expedition has a guiding question. What are they exploring? This should be something with open-ended, with emotive force that students can come back to throughout their lives. 
So we framed our expedition around the guiding questions. What is a good decision? And how do the decisions I make affect others? Next, we identified an authentic need, a real problem in our community. I had a date a couple of weeks in the future where half of my teachers were going to be out. I therefore couldn't run classes as usual. I needed alternative programming. And so we turned the problem over to our students and told, uh, told them that they could plan the programming for the day. They were given a budget of $500 to spend. And the caveat was that everybody had to agree. The students formed their own Knesset. The second and third grade class was one political party, the fourth and fifth grade class another political party. And if they couldn't agree, we told them that the kindergartners and first graders were ready to jump in and form a new coalition. The students researched Israeli cabinet, what the different positions were. They had to figure out how to divide power equally among the two groups. They had to realize how to run a meeting, how to stay on task. At the same time, we were also giving them information about the political parties standing for the election in Israel. They tried to identify who could form coalitions, which were the positions that parties could compromise on, and which were the positions that they could not. One of the parents was a negotiator for the federal government, and we brought him in to talk to the students about how to build consensus, how to identify when you can compromise and when you cannot. The real breakthrough came the day that the students decided that they wanted to serve ice cream. Every student but one. That student really wanted soft pretzels. They had to have unanimous consent. It took them a while to understand that they needed to offer the students to have both ice cream and pretzels. But in doing so, they didn't then have enough budget for the bouncy house that they also wanted to have. Now, you might think that this is very trivial, but it was a big deal for them. And after the class, as we reflected on our learning, I asked them, who had the most power today? Initially, the students answered, the prime minister. After all, she's in charge of the government. But as I pushed them, they realized that it wasn't the prime minister. It was that student who refused to give in. It was that last holdout vote. It was the one who was willing to blow up everything to get what they wanted. And the students really understood how a small group can pull the Israeli government or any government to the right or to the left. For another expedition, I was inspired by a behavior management problem. One day, a small group of students decided to organize a protest against one of my teachers, complete with signs and a picket line and everything. Awesome day. Um, in talking to the students about why that was not acceptable um, and how could they possibly treat a member of our community that way, the students claimed that they did not feel that our school was a community. So naturally, we created a learning expedition around the question, what makes a good community? The students defined a good community as one where friends, excuse me, where Friends have fun together while eating food. For their authentic need, the students were tasked with planning the Forum Carnival, at which friends would have fun together while eating food, to raise money to provide snacks at school so that friends could have fun together while eating food. So in addition to learning about the Forum story so that they could provide the spiel, the students also had to learn how to articulate what made us a good community. What made us a community worthy of support so that they could go out and solicit donations from all around Cambridge and Somerville? How could they encourage people who were not connected to our community to join our carnival to help us raise money? And then in an unexpected plot twist, when the school's board decided to take the money that the students had raised and not spend it on snack, uh, the students took the lessons from the forum story to stand up for what's right even when an authority figure tells you otherwise. In their letter to the school board, they even quoted from the forum story and their justification to, re to get their money returned to them. I believe that these students will always remember the forum story in connection with this experience. Now, neither of these projects turned out the way that I envisioned them, 
when we started. But they both reflect the needs and the interests and the passions of the students who are driving the learning. By allowing students to control their own learning, they were, we were able to create more powerful experiences that will hopefully spur another Jewish experience and then another and another. The act of creation may have been the defining moment for God. Therefore, God linked creation to Shabbat. But for Moses, Moses' defining moment was slavery in Egypt and watching the Exodus, taking part in the Exodus. So therefore, he gave a different justification for Shabbat. And now each of us has the opportunity to decide what Shabbat means for us, what it represents, how it's observed, and where it fits into our lives. And I hope that we all strive to own our own Jewish experiences, just as Moses did. Shabbat Shalom.